Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday. We're, uh, we do live classes on YouTube talking about all things wine, and we get geeky with it. Really excited to have you all here. So I'm starting off a new um, theme for the month of June, and that's just specific grapes and just focusing on those grapes, the history of those grapes, the regions in which they're grown, and where what they taste like how you can expect them to taste, what you should be pairing with them, um, anything that you are interested in about a specific grape. So today is all about Cabernet Franc. Next week is all about Sauvignon Blanc, um, a spouse uh, or co-parent of uh, with Cabernet Franc. And, uh, and then finally we are doing, um, um, well, shoot, what did I decide? Oh, Grenache. That's what we're doing the last week in June. Then I will be taking a break in July, focusing on a new project. If uh, you are curious as to what that is, um, just uh, stay tuned. I'll be letting everyone know on Friday what that is. And uh, we'll resume the classes again in either August or September for these virtual classes. Hopefully, we're going to be starting some real live people in person classes soon. So, um, but in the meantime, I'm happy to have. Uh, virtual classes so I can connect with all people um, from around the world. So if you are tuned in live, love to see who you are, where you're coming from, pop over in the chat room, tell me your name, where you're coming from. Hello, Tawana, coming in from Norfolk tonight, actually right across the table from me. So hello. I, uh, I'm going to, um, um, I always have to share who my guests are with me. Um, really excited to have Tawana uh, with me tonight. So she will still be in the chat room. So uh, don't worry, everybody. She has the best tasting notes, and she will be in the chat room for tonight. So I know a lot of people now for the summer are watching these classes at a later date. Um, so if you are, um, when you watch this video, please just uh, pop over, give me a text, give me an email, shout out on Facebook, Instagram, or comment below in the video. Let me know um, what you thought of the video and if there's anything else you'd like these videos to focus on in the future. So James and Danielle, I'm so glad you were able to tune in live. That's awesome. Vicki, hello. Watching again from Norfolk. Fabulous. Um, at some point you'll dip out for bedtime. I like that. I might too, you know, depending on how much of these wines I drink instead of, uh, instead of just spitting like I, like, like I should be doing, but it's been a long week. It's, it, I hope I'm not the only one that, um, needs some extra wine tonight. So, all right. Well, just to be clear, we are going to be tasting, um, several different wines. Do that sheet that, uh, Great. Uh, here is the list of wines we're going to be tasting here. We're going to start off with the rosé. So if it's already chilled, go ahead and open that bottle up. Fabrice Gaznier, this is the rosé, 100% Cabernet Franc uh, from the area of Chinon, France. Then secondly, we are going to be trying also Fabrice Gaznier, but uh, they're 100% Cabernet Franc in the red version. So it'll be a little bit fun to try same producer, same vineyards, uh, same area. Just the red version versus the rosé version, so that'll be fun. Then we're going to pop all the way over to California, where we're going to try a wine from Andrew Jones. You all know I love Andrew Jones. Every project he has ever done has been um, really spectacular in my books. He could do no wrong. So this is his 100% Cabernet Franc, just called Franc, um, under the Field Recordings label. And um, I'm super stoked to try this with you all, because this is the first time I've ever had their Cabernet Franc. Um, uh, a lot of other wines I've tried, or their their Pet Nat Rosé of Cabernet Franc I've tried as well, but I've never had their red Cabernet Franc, so I'm really excited. An oldie but goodie, this is Polenta from Mendoza, Argentina. I have featured Polenta Cabernet Francs, um, I don't know, about three or four vintages now, and I'm always so impressed by them. Like, under $100.00. Truly the best Cabernet Francs that I have ever had um, in a very, very different and unique style. So thank you all for tuning in. We are going to start off with the rosé. So again, pour yourself a big old glass of that if you so choose. If um, you're not drinking all of these wines with us tonight, or if you're drinking something else, just let me know what you're, uh, what you're tasting. I'm curious. So... Um, all right, so pour yourself a glass of that. I'm just gonna briefly kind of talk about the grape. It's history, it's like genetic history, like what's up with its parentage and, uh, and its offspring, and um, where it's mostly grown throughout the world and what it generally tastes like. And then we'll jump into the actual tasting notes and winemaking techniques of all of these wines. So 
Cabernet Sauvignon is um, probably one of the most like famous wine grapes in the entire world. And it is the child of Cabernet Franc that we're tasting today and Sauvignon Blanc. Yes, that's a white grape and a red grape come together. A lighter style white grape and a white grape comes together and makes one of the most powerful and intense red grapes out there. Um, so it's just odd and it just goes to show that that's how genetics work, right? If um, um, you lined me and all of my siblings up, I'm one of seven children. Um, Sometimes it'd be hard to believe that we are the actual parents, of, I mean, the children of our parents. So your, your, your parentage does not determine um, that your children are going to be just like you. So that is so interesting to me that Cabernet Sauvignon is such a different grape than both of its parents, uh, the Sauvignon Blanc uh, side and the Cabernet Franc side. Cabernet Franc is also the parent of Merlot, oddly enough. Um, Merlot, um, I'm sure you know um, the other co-parent of this grape, um, the Magdalene um, Noir de Charente. Um, I'm sure everybody, that's their favorite grape in the entire world, and you uh, collect it on the regular. Just kidding, it's not really around anymore these days. Um, but that, um, that grape with Cabernet Franc got together and made Merlot, another one of the most world's, world's most famous uh, grape varieties. And Carmenere also. So Carmenere, um, another Bordeaux varietal, we'll talk about what that means in just a second, is another child or progeny of Cabernet Franc. Um, and so Cabernet Franc got together with Gros Cabernet, G-R-O-S, Gros Cabernet, um, but Gros it's pronounced, and, and made uh, that. So of all of the, um, the primary grapes that were the progeny, the children of Cabernet Franc, um, of the parents of those, Cabernet Franc is definitely the most uh, renowned along with Sauvignon Blanc. So outside of that, the other grapes have kind of gone away. Those other ancient varieties are not really grown anymore. Um, if so, they might be in some like field blends kind of thing, but generally not made into these variety wines. So just Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc. Um, also, Cabernet Franc's, Cabernet Franc's parents, while not really known DNA wise because Cabernet Franc is such an ancient grape variety and they don't think that even if we could figure those out that those grape varieties are still around. So it's kind of like this orphan now and uh, hooked up with a lot of other grapes but of all those grapes that hooked up with and created other families only one is still around and that's Sauvignon Blanc. So um, kind of on its world on its own but widely grown throughout the entire world pretty much every wine growing region in the entire world has Cabernet Franc somewhere in their program. Um, whether it's like a small blending grape or a variety grape, a varietal wine, meaning not blended, um, Cabernet Franc is grown in virtually every wine growing region in the entire world. And while we think of it as being native to France in terms of like that's where it came into its own. It was actually native to Spain in the Basque country of Spain. So actually if you can see here, so right along the border, this is France right here, but so right along the border, this is Spain down here. So on like that North Atlantic side, this is the Basque country of Spain where it's actually native to. So somewhere, two grapes got together, had a good old time, and two vines got together, had a good old time, created Cabernet Franc, and from this area of Basque country of Spain, it traveled up into the Bordeaux area, and from Bordeaux, it traveled up into the Loire area. So that's kind of its history. From there, all over the world, it is grown wildly, I mean wildly, not really wildly, it's grown very specifically, but widely in uh, northern Italy, um, central Italy to Tuscany is a huge blending grape in the Friuli area of northern Italy is grown. Um, it's grown in Hungary where the world is starting to take notice of, uh, of Cabernet Franc from Hungary. Really, I've never actually had a Cabernet Franc from uh, Hungary and I'm really excited to try one one day, so hopefully soon. And I will let you know, I promise. Um, it's grown throughout South America, South Africa, parts of Australia, even parts of New Zealand all throughout the United States and Canada also. So it's well suited for cooler climates, primarily because it's an early ripening grape. So of the growing season, there's a part in which the grape itself is fully ripe. And that means that the phenolics are ripened enough, the sugars are ripened enough, the acids are ripened enough, and the seed has fully formed. That is when you need to harvest, because after that it starts going downhill. 
starts losing other key components and the sugars just get more concentrated and you get these like raisinated flavors in your wine. So that key part when it's ripened for Cabernet Franc is about two weeks earlier than Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's just like up and ready to go, just like my grandparents, like early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Like that, that's that's how Cabernet Franc is doing it. They are early to ripen or earlier to ripen than other grape varieties in the area. So it's suited for cooler climates because if you have a cooler climate where the season ends here instead of here, then you need that grape to ripen before the season's over to make sure that the, it's fully ripened. Otherwise frost comes and the grapes get damaged where you have to harvest before the grapes are fully ripened to prevent frost or hail or rain from damaging the vineyards and the actual grape berries on the, on the, on the clusters on the vine. And so in parts of like Canada, for instance, um, where you have a very short growing season, although it's getting longer now these days, um, when you have a really gro short growing season, you need a grape variety that's going to ripen earlier to make sure that you can harvest it. Peak ripeness before you have uh, damage from any of the uh, inclement weather coming from the fall. Also, the actual berries are a lot smaller on this, makes them, making them a little bit hardier and uh, resistant to some other, you know, mildew and um, and other diseases in the vineyards. When you have bigger berries, they kind of take up more space, and so you can get some more of this mildew issues if you don't have lots of wind and dry airs throughout the area. So smaller berries help it to be a little bit more resistant to disease. And really hard woods, so the trunk of the vine and the branches of the vine, the canes, the shoots of the vines, really, really hard wood, making it really um, more suited to these colder climates, really harsh winters with lots of snow and ice, like in Canada, Washington State even, um, and, and the vine can survive very easily. Even in the Loire Valley, um, uh, you have lots of issues with uh, frost and uh, snow and um when you have a harder wood to the actual vine, it helps it survive a little bit more. The grape, it's, the vine itself is also super vigorous. And vigorous just means that the, the, the vine grows very easily and it produces a lot of clusters of grapes naturally. Some grape varieties are just naturally less vigorous than others. Cabernet Franc is more vigorous. And because it can grow in these colder climates, it doesn't have to, but it can. And it likes a little bit more clay in the soils. So it's more suited to kind of grow in a wider area or a wider range of terroir types than say Pinot Noir, which is very fickle, like very, very, very fickle. Or say Cabernet Sauvignon, which to make so-so um, wine, is like you can do that a lot of places, but to make like really excellent wine that needs very specific conditions. Cabernet Franc is not as picky, so it's a little bit more resilient. It's a little bit more like um, hearty. It's a little bit more um, um, personality-wise as a human. It's like uh, no matter what, like they always seem to land on their feet and like make it work. And um, that that's Cabernet Franc in and of itself as a personality type. So. One of the most ancient varieties, especially of the varieties that are native to Bordeaux, were like prominently grown in Bordeaux, um, produced a lot of children, um, very, very active in the, uh, in the, uh, in the vineyards. And, um, and of those children, some of the most famous wines in the entire world are either from those wines or from blends of those. So it gets a little incestuous and here's how. So in Bordeaux, this is this area right in here, Probably some of the most sought after wines in the entire world are coming from this area of France. Um, specifically red, but there's a lot of white wine grown as well. Some rosé and a lot of really, really insanely amazing um, and very expensive dessert wine as well from the Sauternes district. Um, so there are five primary red grape varieties from Bordeaux, France, and that is uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, those are the top three, and then you have Petit Verdot and Carmenere. So out of the five, I'm sorry, um, you have Malbec, and Carmenere is like the sixth grape that used to be grown in Bordeaux, it's not really grown anymore. So out of the five slash six, four of them um, are in the same family and blended together into these epic wines. Malbec and Petit Verdot have a separate genealogy, a separate 
genetic history, so um, they are not related. Um, but Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Carmenere are all related and in the same family. So those go in to make some of the best uh, red wines in the entire world. So remember, it came from um, 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 Basque country of Spain came up into France, uh, where it was uh, grown in, in, in the Bordeaux district. And then from there, it was brought from Bordeaux into the Loire Valley. So Loire Valley is further north. If you stretch the Loire Valley all throughout, like where all of the river tributary systems feed into the Loire Valley, and all these little pockets of vineyards that are considered the Loire Valley, it covers a third of the land mass of France. So just massive amounts of land all throughout France is covered by the Loire Valley. So thus the geography, terroir, microclimates, styles, history, culture, food, language, religion, everything is wildly diverse because it covers so much land area. But this first area that we are tasting from, um, I didn't want to do a Bordeaux because uh, for this class, there's rare that a Bordeaux is made, even a majority of that Bordeaux is going to be Cabernet Franc. Um, Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon, the two children, two of the children of Cabernet Franc, generally are the uh, take the stage in terms of the blends in Bordeaux. So I didn't want to do, I only have four wines, four opportunities to talk about uh, Cabernet Franc in this class, and I didn't want to showcase a wine that was just partially a small part of it as a blending grape. So that is why we're not doing a uh, Cabernet Franc from Bordeaux, France, but I encourage you to try some, um, especially on the right bank of, uh, of, of Bordeaux. So this river system right here, it's called the Gironde. On the right bank of the river, there's a little bit more clay, which Merlot loves a little bit more moisture. So does Cabernet Franc. And so Merlot and Cabernet Franc are the primary grapes that go into right bank Bordeaux. So highly recommend you try those. We're not going to taste or talk much about them today, but that's part of the history and heritage of how Cabernet Franc became so uh, famous and, um, and successful with its children. So we're going to jump into the Loire Valley. So in the Loire Valley, because it covers so much of the landmass of France, it's really important to talk about specific areas or communes within the Loire Valley. So in the middle part of the Loire, it's called, there's an area called uh, Chinon. That's S, not S, uh, C-H-I-N-O-N, Chinon, pronounced like she, and then non. Um, that's, that's just how it's pronounced, Chinon. And um, the, the area focuses on Cabernet Franc for their red wines and rosé wines and Chenin Blanc for their white wines. So it gets a little awkward when you're talking about a Chinon Blanc, white wine from the Chinon district, which is the grape Chenin Blanc, um, but uh, two different things. Chinon is a region, Chenin is the grape, which is also grown in Chinon, but other areas too. So Cabernet Franc composes most of the, the uh, vineyard plantings within Chinon and the actual variety wines that, that are, that are um, made into red and rosé wine. Most people think that as Chinon has to be 100% Cabernet Franc, there is in fact 10% allowance of Cabernet Sauvignon. So they're like, all right, kid, I'll let you hang out with me on like bring the child to work day, um, but you have to stay quiet. It's kind of like, Cabernet Sauvignon's role in Chinon red or rosé wines. Here's how that happened. Chinon um, has been a commune that's been making wine for hundreds of years, and it really wasn't until the late 1800s that, that they recognized the differences between Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Carmenere, all of this family. They were, they were so closely related that they couldn't really figure out, this is before DNA testing on all these great varieties. And so they can't really figure out the differences. So they thought it was kind of all one wine. So, so in these vineyards, you might have pockets where there is some other Cabernet Sauvignon grown or some Merlot grown or something like that. And they didn't even recognize it was a different grape until the late 1800s, um, early 1900s. And even then there was a lot of confusion. Like in Chile, where Carmenere is grown prolifically, where it kind of stopped being grown anywhere else in the world, they thought it was Merlot until the 1990s was how late it was that we figured out that this grape that they kept calling Merlot was actually Carmenere. So there's a lot of overlap, really a lot of similarities in these vines. 
um, between these great varieties. And so in the area of Chinon, there are pockets where some old vines are still Cabernet vines. And so basically these producers lobbied um, the governing bodies of these AOCs, or these uh, Appellation de Origine Controle, these, um, these designated regions of origin in the French uh, wine districts. Um, and they're lobbying the government to basically be like, listen, we have to allow for a small part of Cabernet to be allowed into these great blends, into these red wine and rosé blends, because otherwise we'd have to rip up these ancient vines, and we don't want to do that. They're historic vines. Um, it's none of these, none of our vineyards compose of more than 10% of this other grape, but we don't want to rip them up. We don't want to have to declassify our wines because we're harvesting these few vines at the same time we're harvesting uh, Cabernet Franc. So that is why throughout the areas of the Loire, you have always like five to 10% allowance of some other grapes allowed in there is because there's a lot of just field blends um, or, or uh, vines within the fields that don't really match the, what everything else is in the vineyard. Um, uh, so, but for all intents and purposes, um, we just consider Chinon Cabernet Franc. Um, this particular uh, producer, Fabrice Gaussier, lists his wines as 100% Cabernet Franc. You don't have to. You don't have to designate that your wines are blended at all. So that's kind of the genetic uh, history and heritage of, uh, of, of Cabernet Franc. And um, now let's get to taste the fun part of this whole thing. I'm sure you've already finished your first glass. So if you have, just tell me what you think of this wine. By the way, I know I keep talking about glassware, but um, I'm still so in love with these glasses for rosé. It um, it is so fun to drink out of these. So these are the Riedel Champagne slash rosé wine glasses, um, and I, I'm really, really loving them. So anyways, let's talk about this rosé. It smells so delightful. Um, Tawana says, I'm loving this rosé. It's much more savory than other ones that I have had. Yeah. So Cabernet Franc, um, let me taste first. Mmm. Ooh. I just brushed my teeth, so I'm going to need a couple more tastes before my mouth resets from that. Um, so Cabernet Franc has a high level of methopyrazines, um, shortened just turns into pyrazines. And these are these green herbaceous flavors can sometimes taste grassy, like in Sauvignon Blanc, um, which also has a high concentration of methopyrazines. It tastes like green bell pepper, which Carmenere specifically like tastes like green bell pepper. Cabernet Sauvignon has some of that. Cabernet Franc has a lot of that. Can even taste like other herbs like mint, thyme, rosemary. So all of these green herbaceous peppery notes on the wine, not like black pepper, um, but green bell pepper, bell pepper. Um, those are methopyrazines, which is just this chemical compound that creates an aromatic and a taste profile um, that is very specific to these Bordeaux grape varieties because Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc both have high concentrations of them. They are found elsewhere in the whole world, so they are also found, obviously, in bell peppers. Um, and interestingly enough, when I found this out, it was like, I considered maybe not telling you all about it, but it was kind of too interesting to not share, but it was a little freaky. Um, ladybugs also have this concentration of methopyrazine. So if you eat a bunch of ladybugs, it will taste like uh, green bell pepper. Um, and so, in fact, even in wines that um, are not, the grape varieties don't have natural high concentrations of methopyrazines. In areas where you have a lot of ladybug infestations in the vineyards, um, those grape clusters where those ladybugs hang out and make their infestations get fermented into the wine, and ladybugs are a part of that process. They just get into the juice and uh, get fermented along with it. You can actually have pretty high concentration of uh, bell pepper notes in those wines because so many ladybugs were involved in that fermentation process. So um, a little freaky, um, but really interesting. So um, let's see, um, James Winkle says, I smelled candied pear, I like that. Danielle and I are both getting this warming sensation on the tongue, what is that? Let's see here. 
And also this wine hangs around forever in the mouth. Yeah, this um, there's like this richer texture to the wine. And just a little bit creamier, it's a little bit rounder, it's a little bit more like viscous. <clears throat> so that warming sensation just could be higher alcohol content. Um, let's see what this is. It's only 12 and a half percent, so I'm not really sure. It could be the pyrazines, just that peppery kind of note in the wine. Are you getting like a tingling sensation or specifically like a heat sensation? I'm curious about that. Um, and uh, let's see, um, the love the long finish call. Awesome green bell pepper with some underripe white peach on the nose. Love it. Um, glad y'all like the uh, oddball information. Um, I'm considering taking a whole college course on fungus because it affects wine so much and just the whole idea of what fungi does in the vineyards and the health of the vineyards and these microbes and um, it's really interesting. So if I end up doing that, you're all going to hear a lot more about fungus for the next uh, few months. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so like a tingling, so a little bit more tactile sensation. Um, I would say that's probably the 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 pyrazines. Um, some people call them pyrazines. I've heard it both ways, so don't worry about that. I'd say that's probably that, and um, just kind of this like minerality on the wine, which is a combination of basically like higher levels of acids, higher levels of salt, um, and, and, the, and a lighter body, lower alcohol content on the wine will give this like tingling sensation that we call minerality in wine. Um, a hint of bubble tape, absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me, already losing my voice a little bit, that's not a good sign. Um, <clears throat> so love the bubble tape. I think I told someone when I first tasted this, it was like if strawberry rhubarb pie was made into a bubble tape flavor gum, then that's what this wine is. Um, and um, but then you eat that at the, right after you eat like a, a crunch of like raw green bell pepper straight from the garden. So um, <clears throat> if I could design my own vineyard, what would it look like? To me, that's all about terroir. So it really, um, I'm gonna let the terroir decide instead of me. If a winemaker ever um, chooses to. Uh, make the vineyard that they want instead of letting the vineyard be what it needs to be for that specific site. And um, we're doing it wrong. The best wines are made from the vineyard. The vineyard itself makes the wine. So we need to uh, cater everything, not to what we want to do, but what needs to happen for that specific terroir. Great question. Thanks for asking. Um, all right. So let's get into same producer, Fabrice Gaznier. Um, but we're going to try their uh, red. Chinon. Um, I already got it poured here. So this is a 2019. We did try the 2020 rosé. This is uh, Domaine Fabrice Gaznier, the Le Grave. So he has several different Chinons. This is their Le Grave. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So sorry. Um, and that is just indicative, indicative sorry, of the vineyard sites from which they are tending uh, or pulling these grapes from. So throughout Chinon, you have different pockets. <clears throat> Allergies and, and everything combined. <clears throat> I'm just going to be clearing my throat all night. I promise I don't have COVID. Um, been vaccinated. We're all good. So just scratchy throat. So the Brice Gazin is a fourth generation family. So they've been around for like almost 120 years as well. Um, they just converted over to biodynamic winemaking practices too. So I know y'all have either heard me talk about biodynamics or attended maybe even the Meet the Maker event with Chateau Maris where we talked about biodynamics a lot. Maybe watched other uh, videos about other people doing biodynamic practices, but they've been biodynamic for about 13 years. I don't know if they're actually certified like through the Demeter, but they've been practicing as such for about 13 years. You can't get certified until you've been practicing biodynamically and making your wines biodynamically for at least seven years. And then it's a very expensive, very expensive process to actually get certified. And the global organization that does a lot of that is Demeter. Um, and so a lot of people just choose 
not to go through the certification process because to them, biodynamics wasn't about the marketing strategy. It was about making wine the right way because that's how the wine tastes better and that's what's better for the vineyards and better for the longevity of the, of the land. Um, and so it wasn't necessary to actually get certified. So that might be the case with them. I'm not quite sure. Um, their website is, does, there's no English version of it. So, uh, a lot of this, I was just trying to make up with, uh, the little bit of French I can understand, a little bit of wine speak French that I can understand. Um, so, um, but yes, the rosé has about 20 year old vines that they uh, pull in. So they use their younger vine areas to make their rosé and then 20 to 40 year old vines to make this particular bottling. So throughout the area of Chinon, you have a few different soil types. You have tufo, which is the limestone, really amazing for the Chenin Blanc uh, in the area. You have other parts with a little bit more clay and sandy soils. And you have some parts that are pretty gravelly with a little bit of mixture. So this is a little bit more gravelly. Now, Cabernet Franc, again, likes a little bit more moisture than Cabernet Sauvignon, its child does. And so if you have all gravel, which provides excellent drainage, the water is going to go straight through. You need to make sure if you're going to grow Cabernet Franc in that area, that you can, all, like that area also gets enough rain because Mer, I mean, um, Merlot, yes, also, but Cabernet Franc likes a little bit more moisture. So if there's no clay in the soils, um, if there's nothing to kind of hold a little bit more of that moisture, you need enough and significant amounts of rain, and you do have this in Chinon, so that's perfect. Too much clay would be a little bit too rich. But this is a more gravelly soils. That's why it's called Les Graves. Um, uh, it's not Lace Graves or Lace Graves. Uh, Les Graves is how it's uh, pronounced here. And... Um, Let's get into it. First of all, I just love this color. Whenever I get those um, like fuchsia kind of um, magenta hues to a wine, I always get really excited because usually that's a wine that is going to taste to me lovely in terms of just like fresh, fruity, kind of vibrant, uh, a little bit uh, a little bit extroverted and uh, and also really approachable all at the same time. So Dolcetto has a similar color to this. Some Malbecs, especially unoaked Malbecs do. Um, and I just get excited when I see that color. So that fuchsia magenta hue. So aromatic, right? Cabernet Franc is wildly more aromatic than its uh, children Merlot or Cabernet uh, Sauvignon. Loads of herbs on this. Loads of peppery notes. Um, second one, uh, James says, I get smoky jalapeno and a hint of some sweet vanilla or caramel. I love that. So this wine does have some oak aging on it. Large French oak fats, pretty neutral. So that it's not going to impart oaky flavors as much it will a rounding of those aromatics and a rounding of those textural profiles because of the oxygen that's allowed to interact with the wine when you age it in oak. So that's considered it what's what we call an oxidative environment. If you age it in stainless steel with zero oxygen interaction at all, um, you don't want tons, but um, sometimes zero can be what we call a reductive environment, and that can sometimes um, lead to wines that smell a little bit more like um, sulfur, burnt match, um, cabbage, eggs, you know, that kind of, um, that, that's what happens when zero oxygen comes into contact with wine. But when you have a little bit, but older oak, so it's not going to part those spice box notes of younger oak, then you get this like caramelization or sometimes vanilla flavors um, in, in wine. So great call on that. Getting lots of smoky plum dried herbs, vanilla bean on the nose. Yes. I love, um, I love the smoky call on this. It's like a, a pipe tobacco smoke, not like pungent, like um, cigars or anything like that, but it's like this like sweet note of, uh, of, of smoke. Definitely loads of plums for sure. You got a lot of like a raspberry, black raspberry, uh, blackberry, um, and some other pitted fruit, maybe even like red currants or something like that. Um, love the vanilla bean call again. Oh, this wine is just so aromatic. And the more you swirl it, kind of the less herbaceous it becomes and more of those like floral notes are coming out on the wine. Um, 
really delightful. All right, let's taste it. And um, we're going to figure out, especially with these next three reds, difference in uh, tannin level, acidity level, mouthfeel, body, finish, complexity <clears throat> between all three of these reds. Well, a little bit of this like tingling minerality that I get on this wine, a lighter body and mouthfeel, kind of like this velvety texture. So Cabernet Sauvignon has really intense tannins naturally, coming from this super thick skin, uh, the seeds of the grape that just naturally have more of those tannic uh, phenols in the grape variety. Cabernet Franc doesn't have as many of those. So I'm just getting kind of these, these tannins are there, but they're a little bit silkier. They're a little bit rounder, they're a little bit softer, and a little bit more approachable. Um, I am getting more acidity than I would typically get in Cabernet Sauvignon too. Um, and it's a lighter body too. So for all of those reasons, as much as I love Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc to me is a really great grape for drinking in the summertime, when uh, especially grilling out with burgers, a little bit more casual style. Um, I don't have time to decant a wine for two hours kind of thing. Um, I want something that's going to be a little bit softer, a little bit more approachable, less of those like punch you across the face tannins that Cabernet Sauvignon can so often have. Twana says, very complex. Every sip I get something new. I love that about a wine where it just like keeps developing its conversation with you. You keep learning something new every time you taste it. The finish on this wine, it's kind of um, not an intense finish and it just like slowly tapers off. So to me, yes, this wine is a lovely wine. It's approachable. It's got these fruit and floral notes but it's not over the top, it's not dense, it doesn't weigh you down, but neither is it so vibrant in terms of acidity. It's like, oh, I need some food with this. I think this is just a really, really lovely wine. So very, very, very pleasantly happy with both the rosé and the red version of Chinon from Fabrice Gasnier. All right, we're going to hop over to California next, and I also have very little information on the Franc by Field Recordings, winemaker Andrew Jones, mostly because uh, he doesn't have this wine on his website. I don't know if it's the first vintage that he's made of this Cabernet Franc, um, so it hasn't made it up onto the website. I know it literally just came into Virginia about two weeks ago. I've never had it before, and I think I've had like everything else that Andrew Jones has made. So it could be a brand new thing. I need to just um, email them and figure out more information about it. But um, from the bottle, it says aged for six months in neutral French oak barrels. So again, we're having almost the exact same winemaking style as we did uh, for the Fabrice Gastner Chinon. So six months um, with neutral French oak. So it's going to give a uh, more oxidative environment without get, imparting a lot of oak flavors to the wine. The area that we're tasting from uh, in this particular bottling is Paso Robles. And so this is south of the, the north coast where Napa and Sonoma are. A little bit warmer climate. And so you can get wines that are extremely hot uh, in terms of like their alcohol. Extremely extracted, just massive wines very ripe fruit, um, and, and that's typically the style that I get, and really great values, too, also for the wines coming out there, especially compared to Napa or Sonoma. Um, what I love about Field Recordings is his wines are always authentic. Um, they're always approachable. None of them are over-the-top extracted or over-oaked or anything like that. The fruit, the purity of the fruit really shines with all of his wines. <sighs> Like that it's a nice balance between jammy and dusty. Did you mean that for um, the Chinon? Okay, from the Chinon. So, yes, I like that. So those earthier, zestier components match up with the fruit to give it a really, really nice balance on the wine. I'm getting something familiar on the nose, struggling to place it like a cedar chest or mothballs. Yeah, I like the mothballs, Cole. Um, um, and I don't know if it's just the mothballs, like I don't actually smell the mothballs, but it's that, that smell when you first open up a dusty chest. So um, I like that. 
So if you're in that same boat, maybe that boat is a cedar boat. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> Sorry. All right. I, if I want to keep customers, I need to stop making the dad jokes on uh, on YouTube. Bane smell of leather. I like that. So we have these earthier undertones. To me, this actually is a lot more on the savory side in comparison to the denser fruit notes of the Chinon, which if we were doing an old world versus new world class, we generally talk about how the new world has riper, more elevated levels of fruit, fruitiness to the wine, lower, I mean, higher alcohol content, lower levels of like earthiness or acidity. And the old world is kind of opposite, higher levels of acidity, more minerality and earthiness, more terroir driven wines. The fruit is kind of on the bottom shelf, brown paper bag, and the alcohol is a lot lower. We're finding kind of res uh, reverse here. So the alcohol on the Gaziere was 12 and a half. My guess is it was a little bit higher than that. Um, we have, let's see, um, Oh my gosh, only 11% alcohol on this field recordings Cabernet from, from Paso Robles, which is a hot region. So to make a wine with only 11%, they are like, they are not adding yeast to elevate the alcohol. They're not adding sugar to the fermentation vats to make sure that the alcohol is elevated. Um, they are, they are, they're picking their grapes earlier too, rather than letting them get raisinated on the vine. That is wild. Um, I had no idea. I know he always has lower alcohol levels on his wines, but 11.1% for a red wine is pretty low. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I love the, the reverse role play that these wines are having. And this is what we're seeing a lot, especially in the last, I'd say, 10 years, is some of these newer world producers are like, we want to make wines like the classic regions. We want to showcase the like authenticity of our region and our fruit and like what it can do. But we're going to let the vineyard speak for itself and, and make wines just as they naturally happen, a little bit more in this old world style. And these old world producers are saying like, you know what? The Americans buy a lot of our wines and um, also our regions get, are getting warmer. Our vintages are getting warmer. So fruit's getting riper. So let's make wine in a little bit more of a new world style and with elevated fruit flavors and um, so it's really interesting to see that it's not as easy to pick out old world versus new world these days. Um, I don't envy the people who are studying for blind tasting these days uh, trying to pass these certification tests during blind tasting because it's getting a lot harder to determine region not just because the climate is changing so much which it is but also because the producers are changing their tactics a whole lot too so um, leave the dad jokes to Samba. Yes, I should. Um, they, um, they've been making so many other plans. They've been so busy this summer. So, um, I will uh, have to tell them that you said that James. I love that. Uh, <laughs> yes. And my dad would definitely, if he talked about leather, would talk about his, his riding on his Harley with his, with his leather motorcycle jacket and stuff like that. That's exactly what he would talk about. So, um, man, I'm loving how these like, all the fruits that were there in the last one, I think it's really similar fruits, but they're a little bit more on the red fruit side. So currants are a little bit more red. The Instead of blackberries, I'm getting a little bit more raspberries. Um, instead of black plums, a little bit more red plums. Um, a little bit more on those red sides of everything for this wine. And all those herbs that are there, instead of like the smoky cooked herbs, they're like fresh and still like you just picked them. Um, yeah, leather, like new leather, not, I've been riding on my Harley for all day in the sun, uh, in the in the jacket leather. <clears throat> Let's see. I love this call, um, and I also love that, um, it's so often that couples have differing tastes in wines, which is normal, right? Because we're all different humans and we don't just become the same person when we're in a relationship. So um, I love it that people are brave enough to have disagreements with who they're with about which wine they like more. So James likes number three, the field recordings over. Number two, the Chinon from Fabrice Gaznier. Danielle, reverse, um, definitely a little bit more tannic. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit more of those oak tannins specifically around the tip of my tongue, 
in my gums, the roof of my mouth, <clears throat> in this field recordings, more of them than I got in the gas air. And I think that's because these are French barrels instead of huge vats. So the concentration of oak to wine, <coughs> excuse me, is higher in uh, this field recordings. <clears throat> I have to start just drinking this wine to um, <coughs> uh, rest the throat here. My almost getting a bitter taste on this wine too. Yeah. So these tannins give a bitter flavor. So tannins aren't just the textural drying sensation in the mouth. They're also a bitter flavor, but so are pyrazines. And so the pyrazines from Cabernet Franc, when you pick it younger, I mean not younger, um, less ripe, then you're going to get a little bit more of those bitter notes. So chocolate is a common denominator in terms of tasting notes for Cabernet Franc often. But the um, on the underripe side, when you're picking, you're going to get more of those like baking cocoa powder, that like bitter chocolate note, just like you literally open up the baking cocoa powder because you're going to make some cookies and it kind of gets, the dust gets stirred up and it leaves a sensation on the tip of your tongue, that bitter chalky feeling. <clears throat> and if you wait until it's a lot riper on the vine, like what most other California producers are doing, you're going to get this like milk chocolate or sweeter chocolate, uh, dark chocolate notes um, in the wine, a little bit more of that um, richer sensation rather than that bitter chalky feel. So um, absolutely, you're making all the right calls on this wine. Um, I think that this wine... Um, I think the, the Fabrice Gaznier is more of something that I want with a slight chill on it, and I could totally drink that outside by itself, no problem. The field recordings to me, I also, it's about 68 degrees in my house right now. I probably want these all closer to maybe 63, <clears throat> so about five degrees colder. I think they'd be a little bit more expressive and a little bit more vibrant. Um, but this is a food wine to me, and I want this specifically like with pulled pork, like carnitas tacos, um, <clears throat> I think would be really, really delicious. So mm. it'd be hard for me to choose which of these is my favorite or which I thought was the best expression to me. They're just quite different. Um, and I would, I would like them and appreciate them in different uh, circumstances. So um, yeah, I like them both to me. Uh, yeah, I don't have to decide. I guess I can, uh, <laughs> I can drink them both. That's the great thing about wine. You don't have to be monogamous with your wine choices. Um, <clears throat> all right. So last Cabernet Franc of the evening. Um, we are going to be flying through this class tonight. Sorry, with the fewer people in the chat room, less questions. Um, we just go through these wines a little bit faster. Also, when... We're talking about a grape <clears throat> instead of like a, um, a region. There's a little bit less history to go for because I can't go over the history of each of these regions. The class would be like four hours long. And so just a, a brief discussion of each of the regions and more talk about the grape means a little bit more drinking and a little bit less lecture. So uh, it's always nice to have, to me, I guess, to have a mixture between the super nerdy classes, which are a little bit more lecture heavy a little bit more of the discussion tasting style classes. We are gonna do um, live events again soon. If um, uh, if y'all are interested in it, um, we are going to be doing them hopefully at the end of June, beginning of July, we'll start scheduling some in-person classes and uh, definitely definitely by like the fall, I anticipate being back into full, uh, full, full scope in-person classes. But I will be doing also, I'll continue doing virtual classes, not every week, and they might not be live style, I might just do like videos where you can like get the wines, um, but to make sure that like if you can't tune in live um, or you can't come to the in-person classes, you can still participate in the wine education, so they're not going away. Um, I know I can't wait to see everybody's faces too and give, you know, high fives again and hugs and it'll be great. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay. Hello, different wine. Let's go down to Argentina here. This is Polenta. Uh, Polenta, this is their Exxon. And no, this is not the number that's associated with like the vintage or anything like that. Um, the Exxon doesn't change for each vintage. So I don't know what 11, 
and I'm not sure, have not figured out from all of my time uh, featuring their wines over the last several years. I still have not gotten a clear answer about what the Roman numerals are all about. But this is their Grand XI, 100% Cabernet Franc also. This is their 2018 vintage. So oddly, this is the oldest wine we're tasting tonight. Um, so all of the other wines were quite young. And um, this is quite different. So Blend of Wines, they've been around as a family since uh, 1902. Um, Italian immigrants came to Argentina, settled in Mendoza, as many Italian immigrants did at that time. And uh, 1912 planted their first vines. Um, for this entire time, though, there's mostly like all of their vineyards, which are owned by the family. They were just selling the fruit to other producers. Polenta itself, as a as the estate, didn't start until about 2008, I believe, if that is uh, the correct date. Um, so basically less than 20 years old, uh, about 15 years old, I think. And they own two estate vineyards. Now, when you think <laughs> I own two vineyards, you might think like each vineyard might be a couple acres or something like this. No, each of these vineyards is like between 50 and 75 acres. So massive, massive vineyards. It's just considered like one vineyard. So it might sound like this tiny little estate because they just own two vineyards, but each vineyard is pretty massive. Um, this vineyard is coming, um, it's called a finco, finca, which means just like farm, basically. La Zulema. And um, it is high elevation vineyards. Um, rocky terrain but has a lot of like alluvial soil, granitic soil, gravelly soil, sandy loam, loess, clay, kind of mixture, hodgepodge mixture of everything. So it's got some drainage, it also has parts of the soil that are retaining a little bit more moisture. All of the moisture is actually not coming from rain generally in this region of Mendoza, it's coming from melting snow caps from the mountains in the summer and it's creating basically like these rivers and underground water beds as the snow caps from the Andes are melting and coming down uh, the mountains. So it's not necessarily rain, but they don't have to irrigate because all of this water is kind of coming down from the mountains, it's really fascinating. Um, more clay in the soils but also some gravelly, so this is like prime area for Cabernet Franc. Notice the difference on color on this one, how much extra, and, and specifically not just color, but the concentration. It's really hard to read through this wine. I would actually think that this would be closer to like a Cabernet Sauvignon from the concentration of the coloring because it's so dense, it's very difficult to read, so it would make me think it's a much thicker skin grape variety. But here's what's happening, is as you take these vines, and as the vines are being cultivated and grown in higher elevation regions, like Mendoza, where these elevation, the elevation of these vineyards is like 3,200 feet, like pretty high up there, um, the grape vine itself understands, oh, we're closer to the sun, there's less atmosphere to protect me from the sun's radiation, so we need to protect the berries, because the berries are what the like the purpose of the vine is just to procreate and it does that through the berries. So it needs to protect those from getting blistered from the sun too early. The birds don't want to eat blistered grapes and spread the seed throughout the world. So, so they need to make sure the berries are preserved. And so literally within you can uproot a vine from sea level, plant it way high up at 3,200 feet where these vineyards are at Polenta estate vineyards. And within two years or two vintages, two summers, the vine will understand that uh, it's closer to the sun and, uh, and has more intense radiation, so it needs to develop thicker skins. Thicker skins is going to give, that's where, where the color of a red wine comes from. It's also where a lot of the tannins come from. So anytime you have a grape that's grown up in these higher elevation uh, regions, you're going to have more concentrated pigment but also more concentrated tannins as well. So really interesting on this wine. Um, that is why it is such a darker color is because we are very high up in elevation. So love the spicy jalapeno on this wine. Yeah, I mean, it's like um, charred jalapenos. Like I'm blistering those, like charring them. They're getting black on the outside. I'm gonna peel them off to make chile rellena um, would be, Oh, and now I'm craving that. Um, funny call, but open a bag of spicy Doritos and this wine matches it. Yes, I like that. Yes, absolutely. It says paprika, 
It's this cayenne, jalapeno, but also these other spice notes that aren't spicy notes, like cumin, maybe even some cinnamon, um, bell pepper, but like charred or smoked or something like that. Love this call. Um, <laughs> getting the spicy jalapenos on the palate more than the palate on reverse. Gotcha, okay. Um, but it's like it grilled them, so it's got that char going on. Perfect, yes, I love this. Um, this wine is not bashful. That is for damn sure. This uh, this is, um, so it reminds me of um, uh, when I moved to Miami. I was uh, young, first year in college. I was uh, 19 when I moved to Miami. And um, there was this bar, this salsa bar that we love to go to because um, I wanted to learn how to salsa and stuff like that. And there was this Argentinian that I always hang out there. And um, he had like this long, like Fabio curly hair going on. And of course, like uh, a button up but that was buttoned all the way down to like his, his, his chest, like his gold chain. And um, he'd just come up and be like, let's dance. And just like this, just like over the top, sensual Argentinian and and um, you know, any time we'd be a little bit more shy because we see all the same cats there all the night. And uh, he'd be like, no, you push me, I push you back. And just like this real, just dramatic dancer. And it wasn't like, it wasn't weird. It was just hysterical because he was so passionate about the, the dancing, whatever it was. This wine reminds me of that. It's just like so in your face and bold. Um, really, really digging this wine. Also getting some raisinated fruit on this one, Tawana says, yes, so they are not picking early like they did at Field Recordings in Paso Rebels. They're picking a little bit later, so they're letting the grapes kind of hang out and do their thing a little bit longer. Um, thus, the alcohol is probably a little bit more elevated in this. 14.5, uh, yeah, a little bit more elevated than the 11.2% uh, of the Field Recordings. Um, I almost got a cinnamon finish, love it. It was almost too spicy, but then it finished nicely. Okay, cool. Um, not bashful. Definitely has some spice to the mouth, too. Um, yeah. This one is definitely food wine. And definitely, like, not just carnitas tacos. Like, I want chimichurri steak. I want, I want a little bit of that herbaceousness. So, um, Throw that all on and um, do a really nice uh, porterhouse steak would be absolutely phenomenal with this. Um, all right, I got to taste this wine. This wine has also been open in my glass for, I think I opened the wine about like five o'clock maybe. So, and I, I just poured a glass, so it's just been kind of hanging out. Um, when I first wrote the review of this, because I needed to try the new vintage, it tasted a little kind of wound up and a little crazy um, at, at the beginning, and it, it calmed down as I got some air into it. So I think this wine, it literally just came in. Also, a lot of the wines are just coming in, especially red wines that are just coming in. Um, <clears throat> so I think it might have had like maybe a little bit of bottle shock. Uh, it was just a little bit all over the place, kind of disjointed, but a little bit of air has <clears throat> seen it calm down quite a bit. Let's see. Hmm. Great question. Do you think there would be a way to have a class to help out what uh, figure out what raisinated wine tastes like? Struggle with that. I think um, I think a lot of people struggle with a lot of different markers. Like, what do you mean vanilla? What do you mean raisinated? What do you mean zesty? So I think we might do um, a series of classes, um, and these might be a little bit more easy to do in person, or if I did them because I want to try more wines than four at a time, or if I did them um, virtually, they'd be delivered day of, and I'd pour everyone samples or something like that, so we could taste a lot more different wines side by side to kind of give some benchmarks. Um, benchmarks are really important, because once you get that benchmark, you can kind of memorize that flavor profile, but it's hard to figure out what you're looking for when you've never had a wine that gives you that benchmark of what what is high tannins, what is <clears throat> what is low acid or flatty wine taste like or vanilla. Or, or, so that's a, that's a great um, call. I think that's a great idea to do some uh, more benchmark tasting classes rather than region or grape or, or style specific. So I um, fully support that idea. Stay tuned. 
Like I told Danielle, so many of my class ideas I get from you and James because you just have great ideas about other things that um, can be done for classes. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. So take it to a Mexican restaurant and have some fajitas. Yes, I like that. Oh, I see Tawana's comment. Yes, I want some fajitas too now. Now I'm really hungry. Talk about all this really amazing food and wine. The richer mouthfeel on this one too. Yeah, I'm getting all that cinnamon and kind of nutmeg on the finish. On the front, it's all that jalapenos. It finishes spices, not spicy. But that richer mouthfeel and that darker, denser fruit helps it from being like over the top kind of spicy to the point of being unapproachable. So tannins are there, definitely fuller mouthfeel, definitely more intense Cabernet Franc for sure. This is also quite different than previous other vintages um, that I've had from their wines, um, uh, from the Polenta wines. And I think it might calm down a little bit more. I'm gonna try the wine again in about two weeks to see if uh, if it if it did just have a little bit of bottle shock and it was just a little too aggressive, too crazy right off the bat. Uh, and I will I will keep you posted about that for sure. So um, when you know nothing, there's a lot to learn. That's but you don't, y'all know actually quite a bit. I'm always impressed by what you've retained over the over the you know couple of years that we've been tasting together. So um, it's not nothing at all. You know a whole lot, and it and it actually takes getting to know that much to realize what you don't know. So as I always say, like the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. At the beginning, everyone's like, oh yeah, I mean I know what Cabernet Franc is. Virginia grows it. And they think they know everything about it. And then they realize, oh, what? It's grown in France. It's grown like this. That doesn't make, like, so the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. So so <clears throat> you're just indicating your wisdom in wine. So, um, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Tawana just read my mind. Uh, I feel like the more I learned about wine, the more I realize I know nothing. That is, that is so wild. Um just, just sisters over here in their, in their wine speak. We're just telepathically communicating. Um, but I mean, so I've been doing this for 12 years, talking about wine and hosting wine events, talking to people about wine. And, 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 and every time I learn something else, I'm like mortified that I thought I was qualified to teach wine yesterday. So that's a, it's a really beautiful thing to, just always be learning more things and always realize how much there is to learn. So, yeah. Um, you went back to the field recordings and it was better. That's cool. I need to go back to that too. Let's see, uh, since we've got plenty of time now. Um, wow. I am never early. I never uh, finish a class on time. I'm always running late and speeding through everything. This is nice to actually have a little bit more time at the end. So, yeah wow in comparison after this polenta which was so big so round so kind of fuller body going back to that field recordings it's like damn near refreshing just like bright vibrant fun zesty i'm gonna go back to the uh fabrice gas now Let's see oh i'm getting a lot more chocolate on the nose now um, and almost like soy sauce. Is that a something different going on with this uh, wine from Chinon now that I'm going back to it? Wow. Definitely more of those like grippy, that grippy minerality on the on the tongue, that tingling sensation on the tongue. Going back to the wine from Chinon, those dustier notes or like graphite-y kind of notes, like pencil shavings kind of thing. Um, not related to the acidity because I think the acidity was higher in the field recordings. It's more just like the textural component of this particular wine. All three, so 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 different. So. James and Danielle, since y'all are tuned in live, I'm going to ask you, um, is Cabernet Franc, um, would you say it's one of your favorite red grapes? I know Danielle loves it, um, but would you still classify this as one of your favorite um, 
red grapes or is it like in the top five or something like that? And Tuan, I'm going to ask you too, would Cabernet Franc be something that like, I always forget about it, but now that I'm trying to, I really like it. Or maybe I didn't like it and I still don't like it. Or like, no, I love it, but these wines don't taste similar. Or no, I love it and these wines confirm everything that I need to be true about the grapes. So tell me where you fit in the uh, in the box of uh, experience with Cabernet Franc before versus this class specifically. <clears throat> James says, the field recording smelled like vanilla ice cream after that polenta. Yes. I like that call. It's like um, freezer dried cherries too, um, and red geraniums. Getting a lot of that more floral note on the wine. Going back to it, so yeah, Danielle. I know you love um, your uh, Loire Valley Cab Francs. Um, you love the one from Summer Champagne. And it's a little more that limestone soil than this gravelly soil. Um, thus, I think the more concentrated fruit flavors um, by this producer. Um, I'm curious to what you think about this. Um, the Fabrice Gasnier compared to the uh, Chateau de Huro, the um, Touffe from uh, Summer Champagne. That was one of your favorites. Mm. Yeah. That, that that tingly minerality, that graphite minerality, but this like silky smooth fruit is so unique on the on the Gesner. Um see, yes for me, says Danielle. Awesome. James is in top five for liking Cabernet Franc. I almost like the Le Graphs as much as the Too Fang, and I love the rose. Fabulous. I'm so glad to hear. Um, I have been a big fan of Cab Franc for a few years. Tawana says, I really find the pyrazine to be an attractive attribute in my wines. Yeah, I think um, it is one of the polarizing aspects of uh, Bordeaux grape varieties, um, but I really enjoy it, especially when it's not the only thing that I experience. So same thing with Sauvignon Blanc. Um, when you pick it too early in the growing season and you don't let the grape ripen all the way, that's what creates the Sauvignon Blancs that um, some people love and some people hate, the really grassy Sauvignon Blancs that taste just like, uh, you know, um, asparagus, uh, cat's pee, um, um, gra fresh cut grass or even rotting grass. Any of those components in your wine are not coming from... The grape itself doesn't always taste like that. It's when you pick the grape a little bit early and those pyrazines are ripe, but the fruit itself isn't ripe enough because those, and so those pyrazines take over kind of thing. Um, as you wait longer and longer to pick your Sauvignon Blanc, you get less of those notes, more of the other flavors in your grapes. So um, um, some people love that. And that's why they don't like French Sauvignon Blancs because they don't have that intense grassy note. And some people hate that. And that's why, you know, it, it just all depends. But Cabernet Franc has high levels of those pyrazines. So does Sauvignon Blanc. So if you like Sauvignon Blanc, there's a high chance you're going to like Cabernet Franc and vice versa. Um, because of that, it just depends on the region. So um, eye-opening for me, James says, I thought how Cabernet Franc was Danielle's wine. Now I might have to start <laughs> Taking some more of hers now. Oh, sorry, Danielle. I uh, I apologize for that. Now you have to start sharing your uh, touffe with him. <laughs> I love that. Um, wine, I think, is better when shared, but only with people who, like, appreciate it. So I don't mind sharing any of my wine with anyone else as long as they appreciate it. I'm not going to, like, pour this polenta for someone who says they hate Cabernet Franc. They're just, like, going to taste it and, like, pour it down the drain. I want to share my nice wines with people who appreciate it. And then as long as they appreciate it, great. I'm happy to share it all. And that makes me enjoy it more. So um, <laughs> sorry to let the secret out, but you put it in the chat room, James. I love it. Um, awesome. Well, so next week, speaking of pyrazines, we're going to be talking about the co-parent of um, Cabernet Franc um, that made Cabernet Sauvignon. We're going to be talking all about Sauvignon Blanc. We're going to be uh, yes, we'll be talking about Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. We're going to be drinking a wine from South Africa, one from California, and one from France. So four different regions and four dramatically different styles. I even thought about doing this as a blind tasting. And we all know it's Sauvignon Blanc, and we know it's four regions. It's like a mix and match, um, which... Uh, 
which, uh, which one is which. So if you're interested in making it blind, let me know. Sharing is caring. I love it. So, um, yeah, only two more classes for, uh, for June until I take a break. And, uh, some of you all know why some are still, uh, still waiting. I will, um, hopefully be letting everyone know, uh, a Friday night, um, what the, what the, what the big secret is. So stay tuned for that. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you have any other questions about these wines or about Cabernet Franc or other regions or styles to try, please let me know. But this has been a blast to taste these wines with you tonight. Thank you so much for participating. And I hope you have a really lovely rest of the evening until I see you again. Again, I was going to say drink green wine, meaning like the green flavors in this wine, but I messed it all up. So now I'm just going to say, uh, drink Cabernet Franc and that's it. Cheers y'all. Bye.